Welcome, welcome to the 2019, amazingly enough, RSR review of the NRF Big Show. Uh, we're going to talk about retail technologies and trends to watch in 2019. My esteemed partners will go through what they saw, and I will start you off. So let's get right to it. First, some housekeeping. You will note on the right that you have a questions tab. You can at any time submit questions. If we don't get to answer your questions today, we will answer your questions via email. Uh, as always, this is a flyover that we were reflecting yesterday on how hard it is to get everything in in such a short period of time. If you want to engage in further conversations as a result of any of the things we talk about today, you'll see some contact information at the end of the presentation, and you may in fact already have some of our contact information. We are recording today's presentation, and when we're done, all registrants will receive a link to it when it's ready to watch on demand. Um, so what are we going to do today? We're going to tell you a little bit about RSR in case you don't know about us. Uh, we're going to talk about the state of the retail union and the trends we hoped that we would see addressed on the show floor, what we actually saw. Brian and Steve are going to tell you their opinion on what was best in show. And then finally, what does it all mean for 2019? And at the end, we'll give you a brief update on our agenda for the rest of the year in terms of research. So let's move along for a second. First about RSR. As most of you know, RSR has been around since 2007. And we had a very clear and specific objective. And that was to elevate the conversation about retail technology to one where we're also talking about business. So that we're not just looking at technology in a, in a, in a vacuum. To do that, we needed to have three things. One is extensive retail experience, which we do all have. Another is willingness to have objective insights, which means no competitive intelligence or system selection as a, as a business. We're very pragmatic. It's very rare that I would tell you what I, where I think retail is going to be in 2030 um, or even 2025, because when we started our business, which was June 2007, we could not have predicted that in September of that same year, the iPhone was going to come out and change everything. So we're fairly careful about staying close in. Um, even though we have all this deep retail experience, because we've been in business a while and we've been analysts for a while, we sometimes worry that maybe we might lose touch with what's actually going on in retail today. And to solve for that and to make sure we stay current, we produce a lot of benchmark research. It's, it's a big part of our business and we do it so that we can understand retailers' tech investment plans and the business, most importantly, the business opportunities and challenges that are driving those investments, both for those who overperform and those who underperform. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. So let's take a look what's in store for 2019. And let's take a look and see. First, a state of the union. Last year before NRF, we had one big question. If not now, when? We knew that retail was way overdue for a technology refresh, and, and, and the time was right. The forces seemed aligned. Consumer confidence was high. We'd come to a relative stasis in terms of, in terms of the race to the bottom. I, I, it's not exactly right to say it's over. Let's just say that we're all on a pretty equal footing at the bottom. Uh, money remains pretty cheap. And so the question we asked, how will you, re the retailer, differentiate? And how will technology help you differentiate? So what really happened? This was our going in questions. This is what we thought. Let's take a look and see what really happened. Uh, a few things happened, actually. This was the best holiday sales season since 2011. Nonetheless, investors uh, sort of punished retailers uh, more than I think was merited, but they did. Investor reactions been kind of mixed. Um, we are finding that retailers are still running on what I like to call retail time. Um, retail time used to be really fast. Compared to consumer time, it's actually rather slow now. And what's keeping us slow in, as an industry is legacy portfolios that get in the way and inhibit adoption of innovation. Um, we've also discovered over and over again that retailers talk about generational change and yet they're not doing as much as we would like to see to lure the, quote, kids. In fact, in the years that we've been talking about 
how retailers are going to lure millennials, the subject has now started to change to how are we going to lure Gen Z. So again, we've got to get faster, that's clear. The other thing that has happened very dramatically and quickly is the volume of cross-channel transactions has reached a level where profitable fulfillment has to be addressed. Cost issues have to be addressed, both in buy online, pick up and store, and probably more importantly, buy online, return and store, because that's where inventory is becoming distorted and getting lost. Um, this year, we found that AI is the new buzzword. Um, it, last year, IoT was the buzzword. Now, that doesn't mean that AI isn't real and it isn't important. It is both of those things. However, it gets lost in a shuffle of future speed much like IoT did in the last couple of years. Big change from our perspective, cloud has become a delivery vehicle of choice. This drives retailers to something that I've always thought was a very good thing, I think we all have thought is a very good thing, which is the use of standardized unmodified um, software. This year, this coming year for retail sales, the outlook is mixed. We've got, we've got um, economic challenges potentially coming due. Uh, there's political unrest. There's a lot going on uh, around the world. Um, you read, you watch the news as much as I do, and all of these things affect retail, and so it's hard to predict. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve and Brian, and they're going to talk to you about the show. Got yeah, it? thank Please? you, thank you so, thank you so much, Paula. So the whole point of this is not only to walk you through what we were able to see. Uh, for those people who weren't able to make the show, but also for those people who were and either were stuck in one booth or just didn't get a chance to roam around and see as much as we did. So if you were there, uh, you know that this was an increasingly more crowded event than it was even last year. Uh, if not, here are the numbers. We're up to 38,000 people coming to the show every year. Last year, to give you an idea, it was 36. Uh, there's over 800 exhibitors on the show floor. There are stages everywhere. Um, there's actually a stage in the Innovation Lab, which just like last year uh, is upstairs in what used to be the Coca-Cola Lounge. Uh, it has its own stage now, so there's an entire agenda running there as well. There were keynotes from all kinds of interesting people. Unfortunately, we didn't get to see a whole lot of this because we spent the majority of our time on the show floor. And the tagline for this year was Get Ready, which if you noticed the, <laughs> the slide at the beginning here where we showed you a photo, of what the event looked like was a very appropriate thing because if you're going to go to NRF in the future, you need to get ready mentally. You need to prepare yourself for what's about to go down. And just to give you an idea visually of what that looks like, on the left is a photo that Brian took uh, of just outside looking at registration to get into the show floor itself. And if you've ever been to a really crowded bar or restaurant or maybe in your younger years back to a party, um, it was a lot like that. Uh, the difference is everyone has phones, everyone's staring at them, and people are just bumping off each other left and right. So it's a challenge to get where you're going in the sea of humanity. Um, another challenge that you'll find at this show is places to sit. And to give you an idea of the photo on the right, this is actually the stage that I just mentioned a moment ago, uh, upstairs in the Innovation Lab. This was a presentation featuring a gentleman from Neiman Marcus. Um, and there were some seats there, but to give you an idea of the timing, this was the that one of the very last sessions on the very last day, and it's still that well attended. So people come to NRF. Um, if you go, you are going to experience a, a significant event. Um, one of the things that was kind of neat is when we first started doing this webinar back in 2014, we called out at the time what we thought were some of the more interesting things, and, and my personal vote at the time for you know, best in show was a little technology called Happy or Not. Uh, and it's a pretty simple concept. You have a happy face all the way down to a misery face. And whenever you have any type of experience in retail, you could, at the time, use this burgeoning technology to tell people what you thought of it. Um, if you travel a lot, you see this in airports now. If you're out on the road, you see it in such places as rest stops. Um, it's in quick service restaurants. And NRF now is actually using this to gain feedback on sessions that it's posting. So, some strong proof that if you have a hot new technology this year, it could be everywhere by next year. And Brian, why don't you walk us through some of the things that were going on off the show floor? Well, sure. You know, um, those of us have been going to the NRF uh, for a lot of years. I've been going off and on since 1990. Know that it really started out as, uh, as much of a social event as it was a, a retail industry event long before the Expo 4 became important. 
And it's still pretty important from a social side. It's a chance for us to, to catch up with friends and colleagues. We joke often that when uh, you go to NRF, the first thing you do is you read the name badge, not because you don't remember who you're talking to, but you don't know which company they're working for anymore. Uh, you can see my partner playing drums there. We got I don't know which song that was, Steve, but it uh, looks good anyway, right? It was, um, I'm sure it was wildly entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> and some of you remember our old friend uh, Tom Red, uh, who showed up for the show this year. It's just, uh, just a call out for Tom because it, it's a perfect, he's perfectly emblematic of what I'm talking about. NRF is where we catch up. Up with our mates in the industry and make sure that they're still uh, engaged and in, in participating. So it's a big social event as well as an expo. And over to you, Steve. Yeah, and one of the things that this is a photo, um, a couple different photos Brian and I took from before the show floor opened. We were fortunate enough to have a couple of meetings scheduled before the masses were let in. Um, and you wouldn't know by looking at these booths if you'd only, if you'd skipped a year, um, whose booths these were. And on the left, believe it or not, that's actually IBM's. It's an open space environment, and it was a theme that was really emblematic throughout the show floor, a lot less sort of cloistering off and a lot more open spaces that reflect what retailers are going for themselves. So some really beautifully designed booths. And on the right there, again, you wouldn't know just to look at it, but that was actually SAP. They had a demonstration of some people that go glamping. Um, and to bring it in, they had some they had some real trees with some stapled on fake flowers, which for whatever reason I was just drawn to. I thought it was the coolest thing. So um, good on a lot of technology vendors for putting a lot of time and effort into making sure that their boots are going to stand out again in this absolute crush of humanity. Another thing we saw here was um, uh, the, uh, the the marketplaces were in, were featured on the expo floor, and of course the question about marketplaces is: Are they competitors or are they technology providers? And the answer is yes, they're actually both. And so um, uh, both Alibaba and AWS were on the sales floor, and they those booths were jammed the entire time. So a lot of interest in what they're doing and how they're helping retailers with their technology solution set. So um, uh, the world is changing. The lines are blurring between the verticals. And the lines are blurring between industries. And it was on ample display on the, on the expo floor. So let's talk a little bit about what we hope to see addressed. Um, what we think that 2019 needs to be all about is really informed more by, by our research than anything else in our conversations with retailers and technology providers. So let's take a look at some of the things we hope to see on the sales floor. First of all, we thought that uh, digital and store integration was going to be a really big deal. Uh, I think retailers have gotten over their uh, fear of the retail apocalypse. And those that I call landed retailers, those retailers that have stores, are realizing that their stores can be a big differentiator, hopefully for the good. Um, but they have to do some things, and we wanted to take a look at what those things were on the sales floor. First of all, the notion of a single view of customer across the entire enterprise is very important, and also a single view of product and inventory across the entire enterprise. So, of course, that you can reliably commit to sell anything from anywhere in the enterprise. Cashierless stores has gotten to be a big deal. We've all heard about the Amazon Go store, but it's been taken a lot, a lot further since those days. And I wanted to see what the sales floor had to offer there. Shelf edge and pricing technology is very, very important. As retailers like Kroger's are starting to uh, digitize the, um, the shelf edge, it creates all kinds of new opportunities. And I wanted to see what technologies were there for that. Proximity marketing. This is all about using the location data that uh, consumers are leaving uh, by virtue of their uh, smartphones to be able to deliver just the right content at just the right moment in time in just the right place. And we wanted to see what we could find out on the expo floor. Finally, you can't forget that augmented reality, uh, which we've been seeing on, for years on the sales floor, is still really important. It's getting practical. The use cases are starting to get very real. And of course, IoT, last year's buzzword, has become this year's reality. We wanted to see what was going on there. Now, Paula also mentioned this notion of profitable fulfillment. It's become an imperative in today's industry. We wanted to see what kind of technologies were being brought to bear to, to, to enable retailers to be more profitable for their omni-channel order fulfillment strategies. So Steve, there are a few more. Why don't you go through those? Yeah, and as Brian said, these were, these were trends that we were hoping to see, right? So when we actually get to what we saw at the show in just a moment, we'll be sort of chunking those things into these categories. When the three of us got together, before any of us set off for NRF, one of the things that we said we really hope to see a lot on the show floor is going to be optimization of non-selling functions. Certainly the selling stuff gets a lot of attention, 
but we were hoping, and you'll see in a moment, uh, found quite a few interesting things around the other side of the business, which is all of those factors that go into the pre-sale, uh, and there were some pretty cool examples of that. I don't think anyone could have pre prepared uh, for how much robotics and AI we were going to see on the show floor, specifically AI. We knew we were going to see some robotics, um, but we didn't really anticipate that most vendors were going to be playing whatever it is that they've been at as in, from the AI angle. And that certainly, as Paula said, became the buzzword of the show. If you had to sum up NRF 19 in one word, it would be AI. Um, we wanted to see some forecasting and planning solutions, and fortunately we did. And then a topic that we often talk about, um, and we haven't done any research around in a while because it's very difficult to get people to talk about uh, or pay attention to it for that matter, is data security. So the question is, which of these things did we see and what did they look like? How did they manifest themselves? So Brian, why don't you walk through some of the things that we saw that fell into the digital and store integration category? Yeah, this was, this was a, our number one topic. We wanted to see as much as we could about that. And there are themes that we've seen within the trend of digital and, and physical store integration uh, uh, from our research. First of all, of course, assisted selling with AR is getting to be a big deal. Retailers are very interested in it. And we've seen evidence of that in our research. Finally, there we wanted to see um, new front ends to legacy systems because that's a practical matter. And in fact, we saw several of them. We saw lots and lots of mobile in the aisle for both employees and customers, and we'll show you some examples of that. Uh, digital content at the shelf edge, I mentioned I thought that was going to be a big deal, and we saw some really interesting uh, takes on that. Video analytics, it was everywhere. It was fantastic. And uh, what I was struck by was the last time the industry got excited about video analytics, AI really wasn't um, ready for prime time, at least in a production sense. And this time, AI is being applied to video analytics to, to solve some really big problems. We'll take a look at those. And IoT is still there, uh, particularly RFID, and it focuses on inventory and employee, employee workflow. And we have an example of that. So let's just go into some of this stuff. This first one was great. This is a company called Swift. It was actually the very first thing I saw on the sales floor on uh, Sunday morning. And most travelers have seen some Swift solutions at airports. You, um, you're probably familiar with the Best Buy smart kiosks. So that's one of their big products. But what really caught my attention is how they're addressing the cashier uh, checkout challenge. This solution is using AI-assisted video analytics, just as I mentioned, uh, to identify both the customer and the product. But unlike the Amazon Go example, Swift is a purely uh, video analytics solution. There are no um, sensors on the shelves or any of those kinds of things. So this is an example of the, um, the gentleman who was sharing the, the technology with me, picking up a product, Lay's Potato Chips. You can see me, see me over there taking a picture. Really interesting stuff. Now, I mentioned assisted selling with mobile AR. This happens to be an SAP solution. This, uh, they had their Innov Innovation Labs people at the, on the sales floor showing off a number of new technologies, but this, in, this particular one is something that integrates image recognition. You can see the young lady is holding up a, a box of blush with product and social feedback to the customer. You can see that on the iPad to the right. So this is pretty exciting stuff, but it's not just for customers. It's also for the store manager or for the merchant. That's on the next slide. This is again from SAP and it's a mobile app for the merchant that integrates what you might think of as traditional performance numbers. Those are over on the left with some social feedback and trending and campaign effectiveness. And it's doing all of this in real time. So uh, what the, what the um, agent was showing me was how they could track the sales of a particular item or a group of items and compare that to forecast and then rate the effectiveness of the campaign to promote those products in real time. This is exciting stuff. Now, we talked about assisted selling. We're going to show you just a little bit more. This was a fun one. Um, this one was from a company uh, called um, Next Rev Commerce, or NRC. <laughs> when I Googled NRC, it was the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I'm sure that's not right. So Next Rev Commerce, this is um, an AR that the consumer or a sales associate can use. And you can see what's going on here. In the first display, there's a little plus sign. I clicked on that, and from there, I got some information about the products and the availability of that product. So that's just a, a real practical example of, of mobile AR. So let's take another look. This was fun. This is a company called Shoptelligence. 
Shop Intelligence uh, calls this their AI powered style assistant. You can kind of start to feel a trend now. There's lots of AI this and AI that and AI the other thing. Um, but it's all real, it's all practical. And this is a technology that coordinates cross category product groupings that are specific to a customer's style and objective. So what's going on here is the customer is completing a, a collection for, for her look, the look that she's trying to achieve, and the system is suggesting products based on these objectives that she has uh, specified. Now, I mentioned interactive shelf labels. This is a great example. This was from the Innovation Lab, and it's a company called AWM Smart Shelf. It's more than just a, a digital shelf display. I was, I was struck by the functionality of this. First of all, you can't see it in this picture, but this shelf edge was very active. It was moving. There were all kinds of things that were being demonstrated. And it basically what it's doing is it has high definition optical sensors and it automates the intelligence that's, um, that delivers product, or excuse me, uh, content to the shelf edge. It could be inventory levels, planogram compliance information. It can present the optimal content for a customer based on how close they come to the shelf, and it even allows for the content to be varied based on demographics, like uh, detected age, gender, or even ethnicity. So this is fascinating stuff. That was up in the Innovation Lab. Now this is something that's a little bit closer to uh, most CIOs' hearts. This is from PCMS DataFit. Um, you've heard a lot about headless commerce or, or um, uh, things like microservices, and this was a practical example of it. They showed off what they call their Vision Commerce Suite. It's a unified commerce application that combines a point of sale and omni-channel and central enterprise solution sets. And uh, it's a cloud-based solution, so it's a 24 by 7 support organization that backs this up. And what it's doing with microservices is it creates a platform so that legacy systems can be integrated into it. So it gives you a way to um, essentially a bridge technology that moves you from your legacy to your next generation. And it provides this platform for future in innovation. So this, um, this vision suite will be offered uh, via Microsoft's Azure Cloud, which is another big announcement that the company made at the NRF. So let's talk a little bit about profitable fulfillment. Profitable fulfillment is, is, has gotten to be a major issue for retailers because the, the volume of omnichannel orders, particularly BOPIS or click and collect if you come from England, um, has become such, so much that retailers have to find a way to cover the cost of fulfilling these products these product orders. So we wanted to see what retailers are doing with profitable fulfillment. And there are a couple of particular examples that we thought were interesting. So first of all, let's take a look at some of the themes that we saw. First of all, optimize order fulfillment for direct to, direct to customer orders is a big focus. But there's also a huge focus on returns and getting inventory to be optimized before the sale, obviously and focus on determining what, what we heard uh, as probabilistic behavior for supply chain routing. Um, you might think of this as, as, as optimizing the, the routing of a fulfillment order depending on the availability of the product, the availability of labor, and the cost to ship. And finally, the future plans to automate as much of this as possible to essentially to get back to the cost basis that retailers had before when consumers were filling their own orders. So let's take a look at some of the things that we saw. First of all, there's JDA. Now, JDA has ded dedicated itself to automating the entire supply chain, and they're really, really serious about this. And the reason they're doing this, of course, is to find all the, to shake all the cost out of the supply chain that they possibly can, still deliver localized assortments, and deliver very, very high service levels to consumers. So they're addressing this in a number of ways, whether it comes from next generation forecasting to robots in the warehouse and all the things besides that. Um, there was an interesting discussion, probably could have spent the better part of a day just going through their plans for automating the supply chain. That was just one of them. On to the next. This was from the Innovation Labs. I love this one. This is from a company called ZigZag Global. And I think both Steve and I saw this is really, really interesting. It essentially is a returns management service. 
And among the things that they can do is that the solution can redirect or return to the place where it has the highest propensity to sell. Essentially, it's, it's triaging the return so that it goes to the place where it's going to either minimize the cost to the retailer or maximize its sellable potential. So this is really a fascinating solution. That was up in the innovation lab. Yeah, both Brian and I, when we were doing our debrief, you know, we, we both were kind of comparing notes at the end of the day and said, did you get a yeah. chance to see this exact global thing? And one of the most memorable quotes that I got from the whole show came from the gentleman who was giving the demo, which basically said, I know that if you go on and you buy a shirt today and you buy two sizes of it, you buy the XL and the L, I know for a fact that the L is coming back. So it's on yeah. me to figure out where's the next most likely place that someone's going to order a large and a medium so that way they'll keep that large and they'll hang on to it for 30 days. So both Brian and I were, were pretty taken aback um, by the technology that goes into making this a reality. Sorry, I didn't just jump in on you there, Brian. Yeah. That's great stuff. I think yeah. this is yours anyway, Steve, to talk well, about Well, it that. is. We, we, this was another one where we both at the end of the day said when you were at IBM's booth, because we kind of went our separate directions, um, did you get a chance to see the demo that they had with a South Florida based furniture company called City Furniture? And sure enough, we both had it. Sure enough, we were both impressed by it. Um, what makes this kind of interesting was not only the solution itself, but the approach by which IBM presented it. So the woman who was in the booth giving the speech was a former associate, from, a sales associate from the furniture company. As I said, they're based in South Florida. They're called City Furniture. They have a number of stores. They're growing pretty quickly. The stores are about 75,000 square feet, some of them up to 100,000 square feet. And Paula knows this company pretty well because she lives in South Florida. And the thing that they've made their bones on is, is they've standardized same-day delivery. Um, and the young woman who was giving the presentation, while I said she used to be a sales associate for the furniture company, is now a liaison between the tech people at IBM and the tech people at her store to make sure that this thing is usable. So what does it do? Um, it essentially arms the sales associate with more information than the consumer could possibly have on their phone. She said one of their going in objectives is they didn't just want to throw an iPad into a sales associate's hand and say, okay, now you work with the consumer to try to figure out on a consumer grade technology, you know, using consumer available options technologically, um, you know, what's available. It used to take, I think she said about 45 minutes from the point where someone walked in and said they wanted to, you know, look at gray sofas to the ability to tell them whether or not that was available. That time has been cut significantly in half all the way up to the point where they never leave the customer's side, they take all of the delivery information, um, and it's really transformed their entire business. Um, what made it so interesting was, again, not only the presentation of how it was presented, because, again, this is going to have more weight if it's coming from the retailer's mouth, um, but also was the notion that, uh, I, I just totally lost my train of thought, but it was really interesting, <laughs> I really enjoyed it, and Brian enjoyed it as well. Yeah, I So think what I were some of the things you. we saw? Oh, yeah. Go I was going right. to say, to make this interesting, this was an example of integrating a new uh, front end into an, a legacy application, too. So there's a bunch of stuff going in underneath it that was fascinating. That's where I was going, with the, with the limited amount of interruption they had in their existing system. So thank you for right. saving me from myself there, Brian. <laughs> uh, one of the other trends that we were really hoping to see a lot about, we saw some, we were hoping to see more, was around the optimization of non-selling functions. So what are the, some of the things that we saw and what were some of the themes within those technologies. Number one, uh, we did see quite a bit of focus on inventory management and accuracy and we were really happy to see that because if you read any of our reports, you've heard us barking about this for years. You can't do much if you don't know what you have in inventory uh, and you don't know it you know, in an accurate way, a reliable way. We did see some stuff around getting the right people onto the right task at the right time and what really kind of warmed my heart was not just seeing it in store, but actually in real world applications of installation and service people, making sure that the smartest person in the room was always available uh, to whoever really needed their information. We did see quite a bit of uh, effort on making complex consumer problems easier to solve pre-sale, and that is always a goodness. As all of us as consumers know, our problems are getting significantly more complex, so ways that people can solve this before we ever have to set foot into a store in particular uh, are always welcome. And then we saw a real focus on taking technology complexity out of the store and into the cloud. So what were some of the examples that we saw that? Brian, you saw a really cool one at SAP, right? Yeah, this was the uh, SAP innovation people showing off something interesting. And we've talked about uh, mobile AR for the consumer. We saw some examples earlier on, but this is an example for stock management. So this would be for the employee 
you can see on the left, there's a picture of a bunch of blenders. It was a sample of a uh, shelf set. And uh, what the, con what the uh, employee can do is, is select that one. It selected the one with the uh, exclamation point and then get information about that product, about its availability, how many have sold, what the selling point is, and, and those kinds of things. So this is, a, again, a real practical example of how you can use mobility uh, assisted by AR to, to improve how employees manage merchandise on the shelf edge. Now the next one, um, was fascinating. There's actually two separate examples here, and this is about using IoT with the analytics embedded. And the first one comes from Theatro. Uh, Theatro launched their new, they, they call it their uh, new data analytics suite, and uses their platform to track and aggregate and then analyze and store employee key performance indicators. And the, you know, the fun thing about this is, is that it, it identifies those behaviors that are most likely to be successful and to, to improve sales or to improve some function. And uh, so this was on uh, in prominent display down in their booth. It was kind of exciting to see. The other one is from Impinge, and Impinge is an, is an RFID company. So a lot of you may not know about them, but they make millions and millions and millions of uh, RFID chips, and they follow a standard uh, called RAIN, R-A-I-N. Uh, it has to do with the data standards inside of the chip. They showed off what they called their Item Sense software, and what it does is it integrates the, um, to retailers' uh, analytics applications to drive actionable insights. So you can see a couple examples of that right there. On the next slide, here's another thing from um, Impinge that I, I thought was really interesting and fun. This is actually an RFID chip, and it's a, it's a soft label with it has a woven antenna inside the, the cloth. And um, to the question that goes all the way back to 2005 with the initial launch of RFID, can that uh, chip be deactivated when the consumer walks out of the store? And the answer is yes, it can be done. So this is using um, 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 uh, RFID chip, uses the RAIN standards, and it's using near field communications. That's just an example of how RFID continues to evolve. That was really cool. Um, this one was of particular interest to me again back in the IBM booth, and the reason this was so interesting to me is that the night before I left to go to New York, my TV of some many years decided to stop working, and I had to march out and buy myself the first of my new smart televisions. Um, and while I was in the store at a retailer to remain nameless, one of the biggest concerns that I didn't even realize until the sales guy kind of pointed out, he said, how do you plan on mounting this thing? is that I have a pre-existing mount on my wall from where my old TV was. I was going up in size. The question was, would the pilot holes or the holes on the back of this thing actually work well with the mount that I had? Um, he couldn't answer that question for me. It wasn't available to know on the pictures. So here we are in the store trying to take apart a wall you know, unit that's already mounted somewhere. Um, it was quite the scene. The next day, I'm at NRF, and one of the things that IBM is showing is the ability to snap a photo of an item and then learn everything there is to know about it uh, from a you know, design point of view. Um, and this is available to people not only in store before the sale, so it could have avoided me sort of climbing over cardboard boxes and taking apart my local store, um, but also, like I said earlier, to people who might need this information, whether they're out on an install uh, or a repair or whatever it might be. So this is a case of making sure, as we said earlier, that the, the smartest person in the room is always just a, a phone away uh, from whoever needs to have that information at any given time. And that was some of the really cool stuff we saw as it related to before the sale. What did we see in the emerging technologies field? And again, a lot of this stuff will come from the iLab because that's where some of the most innovative stuff tends to reside. Um, but we were prepared for AI and robots. What we were not prepared for was AI everything. Uh, to the point where Brian and I actually heard different arguments on the show floor about what real artificial intelligence is, um, <laughs> <laughs> which, which again made for some great, you know, wrap up conversations. Um, but to the point that we, we we're hoping that we make here, we very much believe in the capability of artificial intelligence. What we don't necessarily get behind is using it to sell. Um, the technology itself. This has AI. AI is what you know is driving this. We're much less interested, and we think as proxies for retailers that retailers would be a lot less interested in how something works uh, as they are in the actual business case that it helps solve. 
So that is one of the real takeaways from the show is, sure, you may have artificial intelligence-enabled technology, but if you focus on what it's doing rather than the how, uh, that's going to be much more interesting to your target audience. We did see a tremendous focus on robotics to, quote-unquote, augment human activities. And again, there was sort of a, a subscript happening here. Um, many vendors were very anxious to try to convince whoever was listening that this wasn't about replacing minimum wage workers. Uh, you're allowed to reserve your own thoughts on how much of that is, you know, part of the marketing versus part of the, the real story. But the truth of the matter is we saw a lot of things that are designed um, to <laughs> help free up store associates' time so they can do more important tasks. That was a real theme on the show floor. Um, another thing that we saw it was a lot of voice-activated analysis. This is what Brian refers to as Siri for Business. Um, and one of the good points is that it does appear to be ready for prime time. So let's walk through some of the, the meetings that we had that supported that. Brian, this is something you saw uh, over at IBM's booth. Yeah, this was in the IBM booth. And, and of course, we've all seen video analytics before. That's not necessarily a new topic. Um, but what is a new topic is how important AI is into making these things real. So there's several examples of what I'd characterize as typical use cases for, for video analytics, whether it's a, a planogram compliance or checking stock levels, uh, look at the queues in the store, look at abandoned carts, uh, any of those kinds of things, or heat mapping the store to find out where the hot end caps are. All of this is real. We've all seen it all before. But what was really interesting about it uh, to me, and we saw several examples of this throughout the floor, was how important AI is into making these things real. So that uh, retailers could get exception alerts when things fall out of norm of normal um, uh, ranges of behavior. So this is really interesting stuff. Now the next one is something that I've seen before. I saw this last year at the Symphony Retail AI conference, but it was the first time Steve had ever seen it. So <laughs> yeah, um, he he got pretty excited about this. This is a, a product called Cindy. Now uh, Cindy uh, it means conversational insights and decision engine. This was at the Symphony Retail AI booth, and what it's doing is it's using artificial intelligence uh, and the prescriptive analytics that are a result of applying that technology plus immerse, immersive visualization and natural language processing. So essentially what you get to do with Cindy is you get to talk to her and she will talk back to you and show you some data. Um, very, very easy to um, use this system. And the, the important thing about this is it kind of humanizes some very, very complex technology. We saw this in other examples as well, how people are essentially trying to humanize um, very uh, complex analytical structures so that you don't have to hire an army of white coats just to understand what the data is telling you. A great example of that. Yeah. Now the next one is robotics. We saw lots of robotics. and <laughs> Here's just three examples. Uh, one is uh, from SAS and this happens to be a pick function. So there, you can see there is a nice little uh, conveyor belt, and it's picking a product out of that conveyor belt. You can exam, you could imagine this for a, each is pick and pack operation. The one below was SAP, and this particular arm uh, is is showing just how precise uh, a robotic arm can be, empowered by AI. Coincidentally, there was a uh, story in this morning's, um, I think, UK Guardian about how MIT has developed a robot that's so precise in its, its movements that it can actually play a game of Jenga with a kid, and it can actually win. <laughs> that's an amazing thing. So um, SAP was showing something very similar to that, something that's very, very practical, and you can see in, in some Walmart stores now is the Badger robot. And the Badger robot addresses two things. First of all, it's, what it does is it rolls down the aisle and it counts inventory. So it's, it's basically to keep your inventory accurate, to look for shelf conditions that, need, that require human action. But it's also doing it without uh, adding labor to the store. So this answers a whole bunch of issues. The two that come to my mind right away is it helps to optimize the non-selling function, which of course is merchandise management at the shelf edge. And it also is increasing inventory accuracy, which is vital in an omni-channel selling environment. So that's the Badger uh, technology. There were other competing technologies that you could see on the sales floor, but that was one of them. And here's, here's something right here that Steve will talk about. 
Yeah, we saw we actually saw robots that talked to robots. There was one that was a it was a shelf scanning <laughs> robot that would come along and tell another robot if there was a shopping cart in the wrong place and come along and move that shopping cart. So there were there was no shortage of robotics. This is not necessarily that. Um, but it does speak to the shopping cart part. This was the smart shopping cart um, offered by a company called Caper. This was up in the iLab. And there were a lot of people jockeying to see this thing. So I waited in line and took my time and got up there and found out what it was. And what you're looking at is a tremendous amount of technology poured into a shopping cart. Um, the entire base of this thing is a, is a, is a scanner um, that, will, that will weigh whatever you put in it. So there's a scale at the bottom. There's four cameras, I believe, either three or four cameras, really high-functioning cameras all throughout the card itself. There's an iPad-type interface. There's a, there's a scanner at top. And essentially, the demo that the guy was giving was I go into a store. Um, I get some, take some bananas off the shelf. I find out what the skew is on them. I type it into the little iPad. And when I put them into the cart, the scale will measure them, tell me exactly how much I have in bananas. Um, and the cameras will verify that I have indeed put in bananas and not avocados. But the kinds of things that we saw, I mean, there were so many examples. Again, we're trying to fit all of this. This is really kind of an endurance event into an hour here. Um, people are promising some really big things around self-checkout. And the Amazon Go story, as Brian said earlier, has, has absolutely captured the attention of attendees. Whether or not these technologies find themselves into stores, uh, time will tell. But I did try to pick this up because that's just who I am, and I would guess it probably weighed about 50 pounds. <laughs> but there were, again, robots everywhere that you looked. The one on the far left here uh, was one of the more interesting ones I saw. This is a company called I Am Robotics out of Pittsburgh, a bunch of Carnegie Mellon guys. And the example that they were showing was in a distribution center picking, you know, as Brian said, picking out um, orders for, a, for an online order, um, but what their prediction was that really had me kind of fascinated was at the time that, that we went to the show, they were saying this is going to exist in distribution centers. Uh, the next step would be dark stores or stores themselves after hours, and then ultimately that these things would coexist with consumers as they're shopping stores while they're open. So I wanted to know the timeline around that, and I said, are we talking five years? Are we talking 10 years? And very matter-of-factly, the gentleman giving the demo said, we're talking about two years. So in two years, uh, by one person's opinion, who is very close to this, this matter, we're going to be coexisting with robots that are actually picking while we're shopping at the same time. Um, and that, again, there was robotics for everything. There were robotics from Keys. There was this really cool one here showing you how your food could be delivered to you in a quick service restaurant, getting a lot of photos. I had to, again, I had to wait in line just to take a photo of a, of a little pizza being delivered to a table. Um, and the gentleman on the far right is actually the NRF's hired videographer. And you can see that he kind of looks like a super soldier here. He's got his robotic-assisted you know, gear, his kit out here, so that there doesn't need to be a guy holding a microphone and a guy holding a flash. It can all just be one guy with some robotic-assisted technology to make his life a little bit easier. Although, truth be told, it did look pretty heavy. So <laughs> what were some of the things we saw around forecasting and planning? And these were some of the most exciting things that we saw at the show. Brian, why don't you walk through what we saw there? Yeah, no, forecasting and planning has gotten to be very important, and we know this by virtue of our research. Uh, retailers are finally considering the next generation of forecasting capabilities that, uh, so that they can do a bunch of um, important things. One of them is to consume new types of data, new non-transactional data that they're getting from the digital domain, but also so that they can do probabilistic uh, planning as well. And what that essentially means is that they can model various alternative scenarios, pick the ones that work for them, and then to reforecast uh, during the season as as uh, the realities roll out. So there's a there's a real emphasis on new demand signals, and of course AI is helping uh, retailers to analyze them so that they can detect patterns before they become critical. And that's where the ability to model becomes so important. They want to model behaviors uh, before they actually occur, so they can react very quickly. And as I just mentioned, the ability to reforecast as often as is needed as demand in real time shifts. So retailers are moving toward this next generation of demand forecasting. Very, very hard for us to demonstrate this with pictures, but we saw a couple of things that make sense. The first one happens to be from NGC, which uh, is in partnership with Agility and Demand Solutions. And some of you will recognize this as a PLM cycle. It goes all the way from planning, the initial planning process, all the way through to uh, delivery and sales. But what's fascinating about this particular example is it's using a calendar as its motif 
and uh, using critical path process or, or methodologies underneath it in order to alert retailers that they need to take actions and certain steps along the way. So a PLM has uh, been kind of a sleepy little uh, corner of retail technology. It has woken up, and there's lots and lots of activity in that regard. This just happens to be one of the better ones that we saw. Um, now, the next one uh, is very hard to show on paper or on, on, uh, on this uh, screen here, but it was SAS. SAS, we all know who they are, right? They're, they're, they're the analytical company. They've done a tremendous amount of work, and uh, their technology has been um, a, a standard for a lot of industries for a lot of years. Um, they have done a lot of work recently to modernize the, the front end of their store, so uh, their front end of their offering, so that uh, retailers can use this without having an army of white coats to help them to understand the data. Um, and that's very, very important. And SAS is leading the way when it comes to next generation uh, forecasting and planning. And um, and one of their thought leaders is a fellow named Charles Chase, who has authored several books on the subject. I promised to read the one on the right. I'm actually into it already, so it's kind of interesting. Um, but they had uh, they had the author himself on the sales floor. They they were showing off two um, two companies that they work with. One was Hershey's Chocolate. We all know who they are, and the other was Belk, the um, the retailer from the Florida area. And uh, they were showing uh, how they're using their next generation forecasting to to help their businesses to be more effective. Now, the next one is data security. I've had a Jones about data security for since I was a CIO. It's a really big issue. And of course, it's only been coming up in importance. And you can see on the next slide just a few examples of why it's important to us in today's world. There are headlines virtually every single day um, about some of these companies and the, and the outcomes of data breaches and inappropriate use of data. And all of these things have been really, really important. So we were anxious to find out as much as we could about how the industries that support retail are dealing with this issue. And what did we hear, Steve? We heard crickets. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly what we did. We did not hear anything. And Brian and I, again, we had a lot of pre-booked meetings, but we spent a lot of time walking the show floor, and we just couldn't find a lot of compelling information around data security. So what we hope is that this trend will change sometime between now and the next NRF. Um, because it's a topic, as Brian said, that's near and dear to our hearts, and if you're a retailer, it should be near and dear to yours as well. Um, so <laughs> a little a bit warning, of a, a word of warning. There. Yeah, <laughs> a word of warning is right. But now it's time, uh, as we're getting towards the end of this, to wrap up what both of us thought uh, were the best in show. And indecisive as I might be, I couldn't narrow it down to one. I chose two different things that I thought were really interesting. Uh, first, this was the Logility Inspiration Wall. And what's really kind of funny about this is when I was taking my notes, I just kept writing, wow, that's cool, that's really cool. It's the blend of, of art and science finally in one place. And when I got home and I started to tell Paula about it, one of the first things she said is, oh, I've seen that and it's fantastic. So Paula, why don't you tell people what you like about it so much? Well, all those of you who have assortment planning applications know that you may have bought them, but they're kind of hard to use. Or they let's say they don't get used. And the reason that they don't get used as frequently as they should is that line planning tends to be a right brain activity and merchandise planning and financial planning is a left brain activity. And all, those of you who, who've been in a retail operation know that there's a wall typically or there's a sample room and that's where the, the assortment is going to be arrayed by the right brain, brain people and then it's kind of passed off. So what we've seen here both from Logility and there are also some other companies doing something very similar is an attempt to make, to visualize that so we can bridge the left and the right brain or the math and the art and the science of, of uh, merchandising. And as far as I'm concerned, this is a really welcome development because it was always a gap that was almost impossible to, to, to it was a chasm that was impossible to leap long and short of it. But if I had to, you know, gun pointed to the head, choose the thing that I will probably remember the most from this year's NRF. Uh, there was a company called Perfitly up in the iLab. Um, and this was a virtual fitting room, but what made it really interesting is right now you take three photos of yourself, you load up a, you know, you're, you take your three photos, front side, whatever they might be, um, you input the remaining information like your height, your chest, your waist, those sort of things. 
it builds a virtual avatar of you and then it enables you to see what a particular item of clothing would look like on you. What made this really interesting is the technology that they have developed takes into account fabric, so you can see the difference between the way silk or wool or leather might actually fit on you, um, as well as the way that it'll drape. So, for example, any shirt that you're, in this case the shirt, it was the example that they were using, any dress shirt that you looked at, you could then see what would one size look like up on me, what would one size down look like on me. And what you discover is when you look at this photo on the right, even though by all other metrics that we've all learned to shop online might line up, so for example, the shoulder seams seem to sit exactly where they're supposed to and the waist doesn't seem to hug too much, that this particular shirt in this particular flannel or fabric or whatever it might be is actually going to blouse at each one of the buttons, which is an absolute guaranteed reason any one of us would return this. And one of the things that the young lady giving the demonstration explained to me was, or one of the metrics that she was using, is that for every online dollar spent, 40 cents of that is going to be wasted on the return. So the goal here is to try to limit returns. The goal here is to try to break shoppers of the type of behavior that we've all sort of embraced, which has a negative carbon footprint impact. I mean, there's all sorts of things that go into it. Um, so to avoid returns is really the name of the game. And it looks like they're going to have a big year. They are right now uh, rolling out to three of the largest 10 online retailers. So if you don't know Perfitly, you probably will by year's end. And Brian, for you, when you had to choose Best in Show? His, his is my gun to the head choice. It was true fit. Um, now, you detect a trend. This is very similar in some ways to what Steve was just sharing with you. And this all had to do with getting the right product to the customer um, at, and without uh, without uh, incurring a return in the process. So there, it solves that problem. It also, of course, solves the customer satisfaction problem. Both he and I were focused for some reason on getting the right product uh, via a omni-channel order. You can see this one. This happens to be um, – TrueFit is fascinating because it, 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 it has something that they call the fashion genome. And it's essentially a really big connected data set for fashion and footwear. It focuses on those two verticals. And the idea behind it is that by examining thousands of product attributes and then matching those attributes to consumers' personal information – so, for example, height, weight, and favorite brands, some of the things that uh, Steve shared with you in his, uh, his best of show example, TrueFit can help the consumer find the products that will fit and match the, their lifestyle preferences. And of course, the benefits of this are twofold. Uh, first of all, it, it shouldn't help increase sales, and also it will result in fewer returns. So you can see this particular example it happens to be Kate Spade. And, um, and a, a customer is choosing a product, and then uh, there's a little button there. I pointed with the red arrow. You can see discover more styles that are true to you, and a true to you essentially meaning it's going to fit. And then it shows these examples so that the consumer can um, – can uh, build the look. And I know from my days, my very earliest days in retail, I remember uh, my store manager used to say, sell the collection. So if a woman came in for a blouse, sell the scarf to go along with it. And this is a great example of selling the collection, but making sure it's appropriate for the co consumer. So that was my favorite one. I really enjoyed that. But now it's time for us to turn it back over to Paula. And Paula, um, now that the show is over, what are we going to be focusing on this year? Well, we've got some really cool things in the agenda, actually. Um, location analytics, the second year we've done this uh, survey, we did it, uh, it was commissioned by Esri, and it's kind of, we got some interesting data last year and hoping to get more this year. Merchandising in a post-channel world, which is a perennial of ours. Uh, a new one for us, the evolution of cloud computing. We're working on that. Um, next is our annual store report, which is going to focus on how the store gets to compete with the Amazons of the world. Our second annual retail innovation uh, benchmark in Internet of Things, looking for more reality as always, supply chain management, uh, robotics and automation, another first for us. And finally, there's one blank slot still available. If we miss the topic you want to cover, please let us know because we don't want to be behind. We want to make sure it's a topic that A, people will read and B, that, 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 that people will be interested in supporting. So um, please bear that in mind, and we were thinking of slotting that in during conference season, but it could be later, as you, as you wish. So that's our agenda, and it's important. Um, last, a little bit of a commercial. How can RSR's advisory services help you? What we specialize in is customized insights, and we do that for both retailers and vendors. For retailers, we, while we don't do system selection, 
we can help you with roadmap of, of validation. And based on your roadmap, we can help you maximize your time at the big show. We'll do omni-channel maturity benchmarking, executive work workshops, retail trends training, and of course, the usual speeches and webinars. For vendors, we do something kind of similar. We'll do roadmap validation for you as well, based on the data we get from our benchmark reports and our conversations with retailers. Uh, messaging validation. Believe it or not, we help some of the largest and smallest technology vendors in the world with their booth design for the big show. And I can't name names because that's breaching NDA, but you would be surprised that not just the little guys, but the biggest guys come to us for helping with their storyboarding. We do sales training in the event you have a horizontal um, sales force and you want them to understand the dynamics of retail. We have a selling tech value course for retailing. Um, we do content for prospect engagement and of course again speeches and webinars which we all do. So if you're interested in, in excuse me in any of these please contact Linda Wolf at rsrresearch.com. She's our Director of Business Development. And if we go to the last page, I believe it will give you, ah, don't forget, you'll get an email with a link to the slides, also to the recording. You are absolutely welcome to share them with anyone you like. One thing about our stuff um, is, um, is that it's always free. So you can read our research, which is free. You can sign up for our weekly newsletter, which is also always free. And you can do that at our website. Um, you can read our research also on our website. And I think you'll find it really useful. Um, if you want to get in touch with us, and I think that is the last page, if I remember correctly. Steve, why don't you flip forward? Yes, the last page. If you want to contact Brian, Steve, and me, all in one group, send an email to research at rsrresearch.com. Um, for Linda Wolf, uh, here's her address again. You can see our information both on Twitter and under our own handle. Facebook, we do have a Facebook page which we use, and we've actually been very, very active on LinkedIn of late, both as a company and under our individual IDs. Um, you know, you can find me and connect with me, find Brian and connect with him, find Steve and connect with him. And through that, you'll be able to get an in, some insight into the various offshoots that we do in our reports. We've started getting much more graphic. We've started getting more visual, more verbal. It's kind of more than just 30 pages of stuff to read. And so I wanted to thank you. You guys have actually pretty much all st hung around for an hour as we've done our thing. And I wanted to thank you very much. And hopefully we can do this again sometime soon. Thank you very much for coming.